Victorian London, in the midst of industrial revolution. As the city rapidly expands, so too do the numbers living in poverty, many of whom would be forced to labour in workhouses, where little consideration is made for their well-being. The Metropolitan Poor Act Amendment of 1867 sought to cleanse streets and workhouses of the sick and insane, centralising their treatment within purpose-built asylums and reducing their burden upon this burgeoning society. The Leavesden Asylum, an 85 acre site located 35 miles northwest of London. Opened in 1870, it would house those referred to as the idiots, imbeciles, and lunatics of the metropolitan area. Its population would gradually swell, reaching the size of a small town by the 1950s. At its peak, approximately 3,500 patients and 700 staff would reside within this fully self-sustained facility. So you'd come through the front door, um, and be, you know, assessed, initially assessed, you know, by a, a, a doctor. And then that would determine what part of the hospital you would go to, whether there was an intake area, an observation area, just to see what was going on before they assigned you to a, to a wing, to a ward. Um, but it all probably would have started right through the front door here, so everybody would have come and gone that way. Um, and, and from there, it really depended on, on what kind of treatment was deemed uh, appropriate for that person at that time. There was a list of 84 reasons as to why a person could have been committed in the 1860s. These range from genuine mental illness to others that would seem bizarre by modern standards. If you were gay, an unmarried mother, a political activist, or even if you became too engrossed in fictional literature, then you too could have been amongst those committed here for what could be the rest of your life. People probably were just suffering from what we would now classify as a depression or anxiety, which we treat with medication. I'm sure there were cases where people did get better or get well enough to be released to their families. And then other times, the head surgeon had to write to family members and say, no, we're going to keep your uncle here or we're going to keep your son here because he's just not well enough to be out in society right now. So. One of the asylum's most infamous patients was Aaron Kosminski, a Polish barber from the slums of Whitechapel. Committed in April 1894, suffering with paranoid schizophrenia and hallucinations, he was identified by police as a suspect at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders. Modern DNA analysis of a shawl 
worn by victim Catherine Eddowes, appeared to show evidence that linked Kosminski to the murders. However, some members of the scientific community have since disputed the likelihood of this connection. He died at the asylum in 1919, aged 53. During this time, mental health treatment was still in its infancy. In the most extreme cases, electroshock, hydrotherapy, and lobotomization would all have been practiced here, although attendance and locked doors remain the primary methods of control. the same kind of therapy programs and, you know, a cognitive behavioral therapy. That probably wasn't going on to some extent back then as we would do now. Yes, we did have electroshock therapy going on. We probably did have lobotomies being performed. Uh, cold water immersion treatment was very popular back in those days. So yeah, they were doing, you know, they were doing all, all the top uh, medical treatment techniques that, that anybody else was doing. Facilities like uh, Leavston and Caterham all had kind of this prison look to it. Long corridors, big heavy doors, big keys, lock them away and everything. But that's only because that's what they knew how to build back in those days. The site was surrounded by walls and railings. These acted to secure patients within the grounds of the asylum. But as numerous escapes would prove, they were by no means unbreachable. In 1930, the industrial schools situated to the south were connected to the main hospital by way of an underpass constructed beneath what was then named Asylum Road. Whilst effective in shielding patients from the gaze of the outside world, these walls and tunnel, since infilled, could not always protect them. In March 1899, Caroline Ansell, a 26-year-old patient, died at the asylum, having fallen ill four days prior. An inquiry was launched and found the cause of death to be phosphorus poisoning by means of a cake sent to her by her own sister, who had taken out an insurance policy for the sum of 22 pounds. Found guilty of her sister's murder and sentenced to death. On the site of St. Albans Jail, Mary Ann Ansell will become the last woman to be hanged in Hertfordshire County. The hour of her execution marked by a toll of the bells from the nearby St. Peter's Church. In the same year, a severe outbreak of cholera will claim the lives of as many as 500 patients. The source of the outbreak was traced back to the East Lane pumping plant. Situated downhill from the cemetery and adjacent to nearby farmland, it is thought that groundwater contaminated by these surroundings seeped down into the well and was pumped back up to the asylum. The victims are believed to be buried in an unmarked grave on the site of the original East Lane Cemetery which was then closed, where the land remains off limits by council order to this day. This is all technically owned by Three Rivers District Council and they have pretty much shut it all off, based a lot on the requirements of the transfer of, of deed and title and land and everything. This is the area that nobody's supposed to go into. You can't sell it, you can't um, develop it, you can't go on to it. Um, and not because it's unsafe, it just is where the mass grave is. Six years later, in 1905, with the Lich Gate relocated to the other side of East Lane, a new cemetery was established, consigning all memories of the cholera outbreak to the past. On a plot of land less than 80 meters square, it is believed that as many as two to 3,000 people may have been laid to rest with the same number having been buried in the old cemetery. Here, patients, staff, and in some cases family members, are laid side by side. Included amongst them is Eliza Weeks. Originally from New York, she worked as foreman within the asylum's laundry and was finally buried here in 1917. And Christopher Coleman, a patient and the last to be buried at East Lane, 
in 1994. As in life, wealth and status would represent the Great Divide, with those who could afford a headstone buried prominently, whilst the less fortunate were interred at the cemetery's periphery, with it being common practice for several bodies to be buried in the same grave. The names of those laid to rest here were recorded in a book of remembrance, long since lost. And whilst fragments continue to emerge, for the majority of those for whom East Lane Cemetery would be their final resting place, their stories will for now go on told. In the 1960s, Enoch Powell would spearhead a number of reforms, away from big asylums and towards care in the community. Widely perceived as kinder and more inclusive, care in the community is not without its critics, concerned that the reforms act to hide the scale of the mental health issue, whilst exposing those who are now referred to as service users to the threat of an uncaring private industry. Leesden Hospital finally closed on the 31st of October, 1995. But rather than decay quietly in the shadows, its closure was marked with grand ceremony and celebration. This outpouring of warmth might seem strangely out of place when held in regards to a facility of this nature, but in truth, mental institutions have rarely ever been the houses of horror that they are thought to be. Throughout its history, the staff of Leavesden recognised the benefit of recreation. The hospital would host events attended by staff, patients and visitors that would serve a key function in local life. Patients were also granted access to games, music, and the use of a recreation hall. Recreation was good for the patients. It's good for the staff, so they built this purpose-built recreation hall. You'd have musical events, they had a staff band, they had a, a patient band. You'd have events there. This was the real social place to go. If you got invited to the hospital recreation hall for some event by the head surgeon, uh, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that was like the social invitation, um, you know, of the time. It is always the stories of tragedy, dread, and suffering that prevail in the dark light in which we cast mental illness. But in reality, mental health treatment has never been about this. The people who have lived, worked, and have been laid to rest at Leavesden over its 125 years of operation were not monsters. They were doctors, nurses, mothers, fathers, daughters, and brothers. This was an asylum, a place of safety and refuge for our most vulnerable a place where real people cared and were cared for. The majority of all the nurses that I spoke to and have interviewed have had nothing but praise for the care that these people received and for the work that they did. Mental illness still carries with it a stigma, its very own set of locked doors and walls. What do we learn from a society in observing how it deals with those it deems the most problematic and troublesome? Do we find a society that coldly averts its gaze and tries to bury its problems out of sight? Or do we find a society willing to embrace these challenges in the spirit of earnest charity and the light of humanity? <laughs>